So it was uh, maybe three or four months ago when Dr. Cook was starting to put together the agenda for this symposium that uh, he approached and, and said, Admiral, how would you like to make a presentation on a, a topic that we've been discussing over the past weeks leading up to, to that encounter? And I have to admit that after Dr. Snyder's presentation and then what I thought were some very, very good questions and dialogue uh, that you generated with him, that, that idea of making a presentation up here in front of y'all sounded like a whole lot better an idea back then <laughs> than it does right now. But um, as I mentioned in the, the opening comments, the, the idea here today is to broaden your framework and your thinking about ethics and to do so from uh, the, the lens or through the lens of the profession um, so that we can all think, reason, and then lead more effectively as a professional. And that's what's, that's what's led to the, the presentation that I'd like to, to work through today. So for about the next 40 minutes or so, my objective is to try to convince you to find time or make time to read a book. Something new and unique, right? And I recognize that it probably won't it probably won't take place while you continue and finish your education here at the, at the, at the college. But uh, there was a book that popped up on my radar screen about seven months ago uh, that I found incredibly compelling. And I, like I say, I want to convince you to read it. I think that it should be on the bookshelf, certainly of every maritime member, every member of the maritime profession of arms, if not everyone within the military. And that book is The Rules of the Game. Just a quick show of hand before I get into this. How many folks in here are familiar with the book? Sarah. There's a, just a few. Okay, that's good. That is good to know. So this book was written by a, a British naval historian in 1996, Andrew Gordon. Um, and it is a book about the Battle of Jutland. Uh, and the Royal Navy as it ex executed its operations in the Battle of Jutland. And I would, I'd hope that here we are in the context of an ethics symposium that you might be thinking, so what the hell is how talking about a World War I history book at an ethics symposium for? Um, I, think that there are, I think that there are three good reasons. The first is that the centenary anniversary of this battle is coming up at the end of next month. So May 31st, 2016 will be the 100 year anniversary of the Battle of Jutland. So it's a timely topic. Second, um, this is much, much more than a history book. And as we'll talk in a little bit, it started as a history book, but it's much, much more than a, a book about the history of the Battle of Jutland. Uh, at the end of it, it becomes a very compelling read about the profession and the ethical responsibilities of the members of the profession, and we'll tease out some of those responsibilities as we move along. And then third, I just thought it was absolutely fascinating. As you work your way through this book, it, it, it highlights very, very clearly this enduring tension between obedience and compliance and judgment and initiative in all professions, not just in the military. Uh, and, and because it, as it lays that out, I think it's got some important implications for all of us as we get ready to perhaps depart Newport and press on into other roles of leadership. You'll note that I do not nearly have the command of this subject that all of our other presenters today have, so I will continue to refer back to my notes back over here. Um, but before we jump into the book itself and to uh, the lessons that come from it, I want to talk just shortly about how did this thing end up on my radar screen. So one of the very, very best aspects of this job here is the ability to interact with all of the significant leaders uh, that popped through the doors of the Naval War College. And last fall, some of you may remember, uh, but General Retired James Mattis was here for a lecture of opportunity. 
Um, well, Admiral General Mattis and I had an opportunity to have a short office call before he went down to the lecture. And in the office call, we were talking about leader development. And one of the things I was most interested in, uh, knowing and having watched him exercise his leadership, um, was if he had any thoughts, if he had any kind of direction or references that we may look to here at the college as we help the Navy shape its own efforts in leader development. And leader development in the face of the challenge that we said today, that I think somebody, when you were mentioning the challenges we face today. So are we best preparing naval leaders today for warfare not from sea but at sea against a, you'll hear Admiral Swift talk about peer competitors, not just near peer competitors, in an age of precision strike and in an age of a complex operational environment. That was the question that we wanted to pop out to General Mattis. And he, he had an incredibly quick response to me. Many of y'all may know you, he's, he doesn't like it, but he is infamously known as, a, as the warrior monk. He's got a personal library that would probably exceed the combined books of most of us, most all of us in here. But he said very, very quickly, Gardner, you've got to read Rules of the Game. It is the story of what happened to the Royal Navy between Nelson at Trafalgar and Jellicoe at Jutland. So I was like, okay, Jellicoe. I kind of remember Jellicoe. <laughs> and then Jutland, world battles. Okay, sir, aye, aye. So, uh, um, we went down to the lecture, and, and he gave a great lecture of opportunity. But I went home that night, got on Amazon, and ordered the book. And I was fired up because I did the, uh, the quick thing where it's going to show up just two days later. And sure enough, I got home from work that night, and the, the package was there, and I ripped it open thinking that I'm going to get this, like, Mattis-inspired recommendation of these deep lessons about leader development um, and be able to start applying them into what we're thinking here. And lo and behold, this thing showed up. <laughs> And it, so it, it, when, you, when you've got the uh, bibliography and references and stuff, so it's sitting up, it's over 700 pages, it's about a pound and three quarters and about three inches thick. And the, uh, I have a hard time finding good discretionary reading time, much like y'all do too. So I, even though my, my dashes of this quick leadership read were just crushed, I decided just to wade into the book. And I'll tell you what, I was absolutely happy that I did. Um, an incredibly compelling read. And when I finished it, I knew that I had read a book that, you know, I wish that I had read it years and years ago, you know, 1996. Earlier, if it had been written earlier than that. But I had read an, a, a very, very important document that reinforces in me much of what I've learned as I have been, to use Martin Cook's word, Snyderized, uh, to refine and understand my own thinking about my role as, a, as a, a steward of our profession. So, <coughs> excuse me. So the, the focus this morning is going to be on this book and on Gordon's argument. But what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time putting it into the context, and that is the battle itself. I think that that's worthwhile because it is an incredibly important naval battle, naval battle uh, in history, and it's appropriate to just review some of that key information about the battle. So, mentioned, yeah. The recommendation, thank you, sir. So on 31 May 1996, 1916, so just shy of two years into the war, the Royal Navy's Grand Fleet, it was led by Sir John Jellicoe, stationed at a Scapa Flow. At the time, it was the largest and most sophisticated Navy sailing the seas. Now, a portion of the Grand Fleet, the Battle Cruiser Fleet, was led by a subordinate, Vice Admiral Sir David Beatty, here, just at Rossyth and that's just south of Edinburgh. So the battle cruisers, uh, I didn't know until I went through this book, but of note, they were faster than battleships. Okay, but they lacked 
They were similar in firepower. They were faster but lacked some of the armament. And the general conops for these ships uh, thought that uh, the combination of their firepower uh, and their speed would overcome the shortcomings associated with lack of protection. So the German high seas fleet was led by Vice Admiral Reinhard Scheer, and it was out of Wilhelmshaven, Germany, right down here. Now the German Navy had a very difficult task at this point. They needed to break Britain's blockade of their country and reestablish critical sea lines of communication and maritime trade to support their war efforts. Now they were numerically inferior, but in many cases they were technologically on par with the British fleet. But in that situation, Scheer knew that he couldn't take on Jellicoe and the Grand Fleet as a whole. And his primary objective was to, to set a trap for the Grand Fleet, lure a portion of the Grand Fleet into an action in the North Sea, engage and destroy them. So back looking at England, Britain placed an incredible demand on its navy. At a minimum, what Jellicoe was looking at was he needed to maintain control of the sea and enable the critical lifelines of maritime trade into Britain. Ideally, and in the tradition of Nelson, the Royal Navy also longed for an opportunity to meet their enemy on the high seas and de deliver them a decisive blow. So last week, uh, we had the opportunity to meet Nick Jellicoe, so the great-grandson of Sir John Jellicoe. Uh, he presented a, he made a presentation at our regional alumni symposium with our European partners that have graduated from the college in years past. Now, he's been an organizer in the UK for portions of the centenary celebration of Jutland, and he's created a website that's got a lot of great, great material on the Battle of Jutland. Instead of me talking about what took place in the battle, what I'm going to do is take an extract of a 24-minute video uh, that he's entitled Understanding the Battle. So we're going to look at it's just a little bit over 17 minutes. It's kind of long, but I think the combination of the photos, uh, the graphic overlays, and then some of his narratives will provide, a, it'll provide some good context for the discussions that we'll have next. Uh, but it'll also, I think, just an important part of of your education here at the War College. Now, as we do, I'd ask you to pay particular attention to some of the narrator's comments at about the 10 minute mark, if you're timing it, about three quarters of the way through what we're gonna watch, when he talks about the culture of the Navy and what had happened to it in the decades that led up to this battle. So, for about the next 17 minutes, enjoy this, then we'll pop back up and talk about the book and Gordon's argument. At the end of May 1916, both the British and Germans planned to send a large battle group to a position roughly 80 miles west of the northern tip of Denmark. They each planned a trap for the other. With early but hazy intelligence on the German sortie, the British left harbour first. The British Grand Fleet coming from its northern bases at Scarpa Flow and Cromarty, the battle cruisers joining from Rosyth further south. It was a huge force silently sailing into the night. The British were on a direct collision course with Hipper's scouting group of five battle cruisers. They were steaming roughly 60 miles ahead of Scheer and the main battle fleet. Only chance brought the two battle cruiser groups together. A small Danish steamer, the NJ Fjord, was seen by each other's scouts. Simultaneously, they went to investigate and in doing so, fell upon each other firing what would become the opening shots of the Battle of Jutland. Beatty's ships were faster, they could shoot further and use heavier shell. In his mind, he could easily deal with Hipper's five battle cruisers. Beatty was a fox hunting man and loved the chase. He showed extraordinary courage under fire, but Jellicoe was always concerned with one thing, that Beatty would too easily be pulled into such a trap. Beatty immediately raced south, wanting to cut Hipper off from his route home, but in his haste to close with his adversary, he may have made a mistake. 
He left behind four of the most modern and powerful ships on the sea that day, Rear Admiral Hugh Evan Thomas's four 15-inch gunned Queen Elizabeth class battleships. A question that was asked, even by many battlecruiser officers, was why Beatty had not opened fire earlier. He had the range advantage, and Hipper had always feared the period when his ships would be in a danger zone, unable to return effective fire, but being hit by British fire. 3.48 on the afternoon of May 31st, Hipper gave the order, open fire. His flagship, the Lutzau, the guns roared. Within three salvos, deadly German fire was straddling the British ships, and within three minutes, line had been hit twice. Initial British fire badly overshot the German line, maybe because of the bad visibility. British fire allocation had also been badly muddled. Beatty had intended that Lutzau should be targeted by both the Lion and Princess Royal, and that worked. But the Tiger and Queen Mary mistakenly targeted one ship too far back. The second German ship in the line, the Derflinger, was left totally untargeted. But it was the firing from the Von der Tann that scored the first victory. Her gunnery officer, Marholz, managed to score repeated hits, though he said he could hardly make up the target as she was almost totally covered in splash. After only 13 minutes of battle, the first British ship, the Indefatigable, slid out of line, rolled over and sank. Any survivors didn't last long in the numbingly cold waters of the North Sea. Two men, later rescued by the Germans, tried in vain to rescue their captain. 25 minutes later, the Queen Mary also fell victim to German guns. She'd only been in service three years. The pride of the Royal Navy disappeared in a devastating explosion. A huge mushroom cloud, the only visible evidence that a ship had ever even been there. In less than half an hour, more than 2,000 British sailors lost their lives. In total, there were only 23 survivors from the two catastrophic magazine explosions and only 18 of them from the Queen Mary. The battlecruiser's architect, British Admiral Sir Jackie Fisher, thought the ship's higher speed and greater gunnery range would more than compensate for the relatively light armour protection. At Jutland, they were proved wrong, and the results were fatal. Getting the explosive Kordak charges from a turret magazine to the guns was exhausting, and under fire, brutally so. The gunners wanted the Kordak and shell as fast as possible so they could shoot more quickly. Consequently, cordite bags were dangerously stockpiled around the insides of turrets and passages, and this made the flash-tight doors designed to stop the flames traveling between the turrets and the magazines irrelevant. Two minutes after the Queen Mary had gone, Lyon nearly suffered the same fate. A half hour earlier, her Q turret had been hit and the top had been blown off. A huge tower of flame now shot skyward. Had the turret still been covered, she would have also blown up. Scouting ahead of the battle cruisers, Goodenough on the Southampton urgently signalled that 16 German dreadnoughts were in sight and closing fast. The British now realised they were heading into a trap. Waiting a few moments to confirm the news, Beatty turned his four remaining battle cruisers around, but the four accompanying Queen Elizabeths continued southbound into increasingly heavy German fire. Using the same spot around which to turn his ships and reverse course was a mistake. Evan Thomas only made it easier for the German gunners. All they needed to do was to keep their guns trained on the very same spot as the British obligingly steamed into the cauldron of fire. Beatty's ships had been hit badly, after 75 minutes by around 44 heavy calibre shells, and the Germans less than half that amount. After the Queen Mary exploded, Beatty came to an awful conclusion. He turned to his flag captain, Ernie Chatfield, and muttered, there seems to be something wrong with our bloody ships today. Now it was Beatty's fortunes that rose, as the four Queen Elizabeths began to move north, shielding his rear. Pressure on his own four ships was relieved, but damage to the battleships was extensive, even if they dealt out equal punishment. But the British trap nearly wasn't ready at all. Jellicoe only had the roughest idea of the position and course of the two German forces. His repeated and increasingly exasperated requests for information were all but ignored by Beatty, who was busy fighting his own battle. Five minutes before six, the ships of the Grand Fleet and the battlecruiser fleets were finally able to make each other out in the hazy mist. But crucially, Jellicoe himself still could not see any German ships. The British commander-in-chief literally only had minutes in which to decide how to best meet the invisible threat. The timing was critical, 
to avoid his own fleet being caught in the middle of the manoeuvre when most of his firepower could not be brought to bear. Jellicoe deployed the Grand Fleet to port towards the Danish coastline. The fleet literally remodelled itself from six parallel lines, each with four dreadnoughts, into one continuous line five and a half miles long, designed to hurl the maximum amount of steel against the enemy. The manoeuvre was brilliant. It blocked Shear within a semicircle of British guns. And turning so many ships in such little space required extraordinary seamanship. There were close calls, but not one collision amongst the 122 ship's captains. First the British fleet steered towards Denmark, then turned south to parallel the coast. It might have seemed as though Jellicoe was steaming away from the German fleet, but in fact he was positioning his own fleet more carefully. As Beatty took the line ahead of the Grand Fleet so that he could position his own battle cruisers in the van, Admiral Arbuthnot crossed dangerously close, only getting two of his four ships through Beatty's own line. The defence and warrior headed straight towards the Germans, intent on attacking the crews of Wiesbaden. Instead, the defence was met with a hail of fire. It exploded in a fireball and sank with all hands. The German ships were now silhouetted against the western setting sun, while Jellicoe's own were almost invisible, lost in a grey murk. The German fleet's direct route home had been cut off by the Grand Fleet, putting themselves in between their opponents and their harbour. The Germans had become increasingly boxed in, first by Beatty in the west, then Jellicoe to the north, and now a new force, Horace Hood's 3rd Battle Cruiser Squadron to the east. Things started well for Hood. The Invincible went to the rescue of the Chester, where the young, wounded Jack Cornwall continued to man his post on her forward gun. A few days later, he would die of his wounds. Posthumously, he would receive the Victoria Cross for his bravery. Invincible shooting found its mark, mortally damaging one of her aggressors, the Wiesbaden. There was only to be one survivor, the stoker Hugo Zenner, and among the dead was Gorg Falk, the much beloved German poet. Then at 6.30, another huge explosion. Invincible had blown up. All her crew, except six, had gone down with her. And all that was left this time were just the two halves, stern and bow, sticking upright out of the shallow waters. At first, the British sailors cheered, they thought it was a German wreck, and then they saw her name. 60 metres below, Invincible's aft gun can still be seen, pointing majestically out beneath the cold grey waters of the North Sea. Hipper's ships were out in front of the main battle fleet's dreadnoughts, strung out in a line that was nine miles long. His leading ships were coming under a terrible and increasing rain of British shells. The range was short, around 10,000 yards, and British shooting was superb. 23 heavy hits in minutes. Jellicoe's own flagship, the Iron Duke, hit the Koenig seven times in as many minutes. Although to give you an idea of just how bad the visibility was, Iron Duke's gunnery officer was even nervous at this point about opening fire. He wasn't sure if the ship he saw was an enemy or a friend. She was stunned, but only for a moment. He quickly recovered and ordered a complete turnabout of his battle fleet, Within four minutes, his ships, now steaming away from Jellicoe, vanished into the mist. Jellicoe was left totally in the dark. None of the captains who'd seen what happened reported anything back to him. The Royal Navy had become victim to its own traditions. Speak only when spoken to, do something only when ordered. This navy was not an easy place for officers with initiative. The British Admiral decided against following Cher into the mist. He doubted he would catch him. But more important, he was also convinced, some say obsessed, that his ships would steam onto mines laid by the German ships in their wake. In fact, his belief that all German destroyers carried mines was wrong, but his intentions had been laid out and agreed to by the Admiralty two years before the battle. Then Scheer surprised Jellicoe a second time. He reversed the previous turn to relaunch another attack of the British line. It seemed like madness. Under intense fire, the front of the German line again buckled, bunching up so badly this time that before Scheer even ordered another turn, the leading ship started to turn independently, so desperate were they to get out from under British fire. Out in front, Hipper's battle cruisers were now in tatters. Only one option seemed open to Scheer, to get his main battle fleet home as fast as possible, and certainly before daylight, and what would undoubtedly be his fleet's annihilation. He now ordered waves of torpedo attacks, and with the command, ran and find a charge of the heavily damaged battle cruisers at the British line, no matter what the cost. 
it was Scheer's only way to cover the escape of the main battle fleet. Scheer knew his opponent and correctly anticipated Jellicoe's next move. The threat was enough for the British Admiral to turn the Grand Fleet away from the swarm of oncoming German torpedoes to try to outrun them. Turning towards the torpedoes would have been exceptionally dangerous. The closing speed alone would have been around 45 miles an hour rather than five, and the time taken for the complete turn might just have been too long. Not one single one of the 31 torpedoes that eventually reached the British line hit a British ship, though there were many close calls. Jellicoe was, as he knew he would be, widely criticised by much of the press and by the British public and by many of those in the Admiralty who specifically had approved of his intended actions two years earlier, including Churchill, even by Beatty privately. But as Beatty later wrote when he himself was C&C of the British fleet, when you're winning, risk nothing. While Jellicoe only had an inkling where the German fleet was, Beatty signalled that his battle cruisers should take over the lead. At that point, the nearest German ship was probably nine miles distant. Jellicoe nevertheless followed Beatty's suggestion, ordering Jerem to support him. But Jerem had no idea where Beatty was. Between the two lines of adversary ships, however, were two light cruisers, the Caroline and the Royalist. They could, in fact, see the Germans, and they promptly engaged. Unluckily, Caroline's torpedo, aimed at the battleship Westphalen, went right underneath her. British torpedoes were, in fact, notoriously unreliable. The two light cruisers then requested help, but were turned down. Rear Admiral Jerome was not persuaded that the targets weren't, in fact, beaties. Jerome's actions lost the British 15 minutes of continued action in daylight, and that might not have been decisive in itself, but it might also have very easily cost Scheer another ship or two so heavily damaged were they by now. At nightfall, both fleets reorganised. Jellicoe wanted to actually avoid a night action. It left too much to chance. Dreadnoughts, in his mind, were far too vulnerable to short-range torpedo attacks, and German night fighting equipment and experience actually superior to that of the Royal Navy in some critical areas. The smaller guns, the secondary armament on German ships, were directly trained by searchlights that could, one moment, send out a powerful pinpoint light operating with an iris-like shutter, and then, just as fast, completely open up to full illumination for full main battery fire. British searchlights, by comparison, were extremely crude. The British didn't even have star shells, which the Germans did. At this point, there was only one thing that was really on Scheer's mind, to break through the British Lion and to take his ships to safety, and he had three routes to choose from. But to get through, he had first to break through the protective screen of the 58 destroyers that Jellicoe had placed five miles behind the Grand Fleet, and Scheer knew about these destroyers from intercepted messages. At 10 p.m., Scheer decided to take the shortest route. He headed southeast for the Horns Reef. Throughout the day, some of the Admiralty signals were quite misleading, making Jellicoe doubtful of subsequent intelligence, starting with the now infamous message stating that Scheer's flagship was still in harbour, and before five o'clock, that illusion had been shattered. Distrustful of the intelligence he was getting, Jellicoe made up his own mind. He headed direct south to the Jade. What was worse was that none of the signal intercepts that had been decrypted by Room 40, revealing the true destination of the German High Seas Fleet, were passed on. Jellicoe was furious when he found out after the war's end. During the next few hours, there would be seven separate, unequal, but bitterly fought engagements between small British destroyer flotillas and German battleships and their escorts. In one, the British 4th Flotilla lost a full 70% of her ships. One of her destroyers, the 935-tonne Spitfire, physically clashing bow to bow with the 20,000-tonne dreadnought, the Nassau. In another engagement, the Rhineland physically sliced a British destroyer in two. But the British were also able to claim some successes in the night action. A torpedo shot from the British destroyer Onsort claimed the pre-dreadnought, the SMS Pommern. Her secondary armaments magazine caught fire and she exploded in front of the German line with more than 800 deaths. Not one single report of the many flotillas' actions reached the Iron Duke that night. While German Telefunken signals certainly blocked some of the radio reports, most captains did not understand the value of sending back information to the flagship. Eventually the Germans did succeed in punching through the British line, and Jellicoe had no idea that they'd even done so. 
Despite the many opportunities, the British failed to sink the massively damaged Seidlitz, and the Germans themselves were responsible for scuttling the Lutzar. Seidlitz would not rejoin the fleet until mid-September, Derflinger not until the next month. Jellica was ready four hours after reaching Scarpa, and Tiger, Princess Royal, Barham and Malaya were repaired by July, while each of five German battleships needed 50 days of repairs in dock. On the basis of sinking more ships, and because more British sailors died in the battle, the Germans claimed victory. The Kaiser, welcoming the fleet back on the 1st of June, declared that the spirit of Trafalgar and British sea power had finally been destroyed. But to claim any victory, one needs to have achieved one's stated objectives, and the German intentions of ending the British blockade or seriously damaging the Grand Fleet had clearly failed. And although one might say that the German high seas fleet fought with great courage and inflicted heavy pain on the Royal Navy, it was not able to again successfully challenge the British and finish what had been started at Jutland. British sea dominance remained intact and it seemed as if nothing had in fact changed. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. I know that it was a whole lot better than me trying to describe what took place in the North Sea 100 years ago, and really do appreciate Nick Jellicoe's um, letting us use that as part of our presentation here today. So while, as an area said, while Germany claimed victory due to greater tonnage sunk and greater loss of life of their adversary, the battle is considered basically a strategic victory for the British. The blockade of Germany remained intact, and the high seas fleet never again challenged the Grand Fleet. But it, the intent today isn't to focus on the battle itself, uh, but rather Gordon's book on that battle and the lessons that he discovered as he studied what had happened to the Royal Navy. So we'll shift back to the book. In the beginning of the book, in Gordon's introduction, he explains that his interest originated out of really a historical argument. So he was speaking one afternoon with another naval historian and I don't know if you remember in the video, but when the four Queen Elizabeth battleships that were behind Beatty, and Beatty and the battleships were headed south because they had um, established contact with the German high seas fleet, the fifth battle cruisers of Sir Hugh Evan Thomas, well, when Beatty discovered that they were engaged with just Hipper, and the scouting element of the German high seas fleet, and they discovered that the actual rest of the high seas fleet were right on their tail, but it was only Beatty with his battle cruisers. Beatty decides to turn back to the north and to uh, um, join back up with Jellico. In the course of making those maneuvers, however, a signal went to the fifth battle squadron of Hugh Evan Thomas, and that was to turn in succession, and it was executed minutes after all the ships realized that the German high seas fleet was really on their way. And so, as they pointed out there, each of those ships, they turned in succession at the same location. So they were all in a, in a column headed south, turned in succession. And in many, a controversial aspect of this is, should Evan Thomas, knowing what his ships were gonna be due, should he have simply executed the order that he had been given by Beatty? Or should he have learned, turned all at once, um, once he understood the situation? Well, when, when Gordon suggested that and brought this controversy up with another naval historian, he got such an animated response about what, what Beatty would be telling him at that point uh, that Gordon's interest in the battle grew significantly. Now, he didn't have any primary source research on the battle. Everything that he knew about the battle was through others. And so because of that disagreement, he plunged deeply into uh, his own research and original source or primary source research. And as he did, the more he got into his study of the battle, the more he found himself less interested in the mechanics of the battle and kind of the what if, could have, and should have questions and much, much more focused on what had happened to the command culture of the Royal Navy from Nelson to Trafalgar and the key forces that ended up driving those changes. 
So I recognize we have a joint force here, and I would hope that the naval, the, when I speak of Trafalgar here, that the naval members of the audience would intuitively understand who we're talking about and what happened there, but for those naval officers that don't, uh, and for the rest of our joint and interagency and international force, let me just talk a, a couple of key points about Trafalgar. So 21 October 1805, off the southwest coast of Spain, and it was the most decisive naval engagement of the Napoleonic Wars. And in it, Nelson and his 27 ships went up against the combined ships of the Spanish and French fleets, 33 ships of the line, 41 ships in total. And over the course of that battle, 22 French and Spanish ships went to the bottom of the sea, while Nelson and his force, despite casualties, lost not a single vessel. And the manner in which Nelson commanded during the Battle of Trafalgar, which was consistent with the manner in which he commanded throughout his career, it sealed his legacy. He focused all of his energy on setting conditions for success in battle well before the battle itself, with consistent face-to-face -face meetings with his commanders, with constant discussions about the enemy, the situation, and his intent, and with an absolute focus on initiative and empowering subordinates, Nelson effectively exercised decentralized control and is often considered to be a master of what we now call mission command. Gordon writes that Nelson's, quote, greatest gift of leadership was to raise juniors above the need of supervision. Okay, so back to the book. So about halfway through the book, Gordon's got a chapter entitled The Long Calm Lee of Trafalgar. It's here that Gordon moves really away from the kind of the mechanics of the battle itself, and he spends about the next 200 or so pages recounting the changes in British command culture and the drivers of those changes in that 100 years between Trafalgar and then Jutland. In the aftermath of Trafalgar, the British Navy reigned supreme on the oceans of the world. And they did so during a, a period of significant social and technological change. The period witnessed the rise of Victorian culture in Britain as the country enjoyed prosperity and the ever-increasing spread of its empire. Gordon states, quote, the Victorians sought to structure and codify as many fields of behavior as possible in order to regulate their world to disarm the unpredictable, and to perpetuate the status quo. William Manchester writes in the book, The Last Lion, but talking about the Victorians, he writes that central to the Victorians' worldview was, quote, firm belief in obedience, obedience to God, to the queen, and to one's superiors. It was a time of pervasive authoritarianism, unquestioning submission to orders. And the way to succeed in life, as in sport, was thought of to play by the rules of the game, to comply with the established order. Now, with some understanding, Gordon notes that, quote, the tendency of the late Victorians to ritualize and regulate, thereby tokenize warfare, was perhaps a natural one for the world's most foremost territorial freeholder. So it was also a period of significant technological change. Alongside the Industrial Revolution, ships went from sail to steam, and the weapons on them went from cannons to gun. Gordon asserts that these changes resulted in what he called a new era of seamanship. A new era of, quote, seamanship of iron and steam in which mathematics were subverting the art of centuries, and the vista of possibilities opened up for tightly choreographed geometric evolutions far beyond what had been possible while sailing fleets. So Gordon argues that it was the combination of these social 
and technological changes, and that they had a significant impact on the culture of the Royal Navy. As the Navy looked back to the, the legacy of Nelson, and they looked forward to what they considered the almost unlimited potential of controlled fleet actions, quote, the Victorians chose to extract the myth of the central genius directing the lovely obedient fleet with brilliance and precision. As we saw in the video, Jutland was to prove the shortcomings of this approach to command and control. Now one indicator of this approach, this authoritarian approach to command and control, is evident in the Royal Navy's signal book, what Gordon calls the supreme agent of centralization. So the book itself, versions of the book, dated back to 1799. So it was in use when Nelson led the British fleet at Trafalgar. But what changed from Nelson's time was its size and its role. In the early days, the signal book's limitations were well understood, and its use was to, in a limited manner, supplement commander's intent. At the end of the 19th century, however, it had grown to over 500 pages and in two volumes. And it was seen as a key to not only fleet maneuvering, but also effective fleet operations. Now, at the end of the book, Gordon acknowledges that the Grand Fleet achieved its strategic objectives at Jutlands to maintain sea control and to hold at bay the threat from the German high seas fleet. At the same time, though, he questions whether Jellicoe and the Royal Navy had given Jutland their best shot. He noted, quote, war is infinitely unpredictable in detail. Nobody can expect to control it. And the power of a military force must include its capacity to respond rapidly and effectively to unscripted eventualities. And with that in mind, he states that Jellicoe's main fault was that control was a contract he tried to make fate with. He feared losing it and imposed a doctrinal regime which seemingly presumed to govern the very nature of war. One has to wonder, Gordon implicitly questions, how World War I may have transpired if the Grand Fleet had operated with a decentralized command structure, clear commander's intent, subordinate empowerment, and individual initiative. So now, as you can imagine, with 700 pages to talk, there's a lot more in this book than what I've quickly gone over. A couple of other just key highlights. First, the story of Vice Admiral Sir George Tyron. That story includes his attempts in the 1890s to reinstill a Nelsonian spirit in the Royal Navy and decentralized approach to operations. The Victoria Camperdown collision in 1893. He was on the flagship of the Victoria at the time. He had sent a signal, but the collision basically ended all of his efforts to reinstill, if you will, the Nelson Touch in the Royal Navy. And central to this part of the book and this story is the court-martial in which the bridge teams of both ships, they were exonerated, even though they knew that the ordered maneuver, there were two columns abreast, and the ordered maneuver was to turn into each other to basically be columns abreast, heading back 180 degrees, but at a much less distance in between. They knew that the ordered maneuver, based on the speed that they were going at and the current distance, was going to result in a collision. But they held fast to the culture of obedience and compliance, and they simply executed the order. No one was held accountable at the court-martial. Additionally, Gordon covers his own lessons learned from these research, and he's got 28 what he calls syndromes that still impact fleets at sea in the modern world today. And then one that I thought was fascinating was his discussion of regulators and rat catchers. Regulators, talking about the natural peacetime rise of the predominance of regulators in militaries in general, 
navies in specifically. And therefore, when you're thinking about leader development, the very explicit and deliberate need to purposefully develop rat catchers, officers comfortable with uncertainty and ambiguity and ready to exercise initiative when appropriate. So before discussing my key, my key takeaways from this book, I do want to highlight that the book itself is not without its critics. Some scholars of naval history see Gordon as maybe a little too negative in his treatment of Jellicoe and a little too pro Beatty in his outlook. And others argue that the rules of the game, it fails to give the Royal Navy full credit for their successful incorporation of some of the emerging technologies at the time. Efficient, reliable mechanical propulsion, the central direction of gunnery, the beginnings of automatic fire control, the employment of signals intelligent, and the beginning use of wireless communications. But despite those critiques of the book, what I would offer is when I finally got through the 700 pages, it is and remains a very powerful book for me. So I read this book during a time when I was refining in my own mind what the profession of arms meant to me, what my professional identity was, what it should be, and how I should think about ethics in that framework. And so within that context, this book spoke incredibly loud to me. It challenged me to think much more broadly about professional military ethics, far beyond rules-based, compliance focus of ethics that I had become accustomed to over the course of my career. That story of the Royal Navy in the 19th century, it pointed out to me that a profession's identity, the culture that underpins it, is never static, but rather it is in a constant state of evolution. Left unattended, that culture will morph, and there is a natural tendency, a natural tendency for bureaucratic attributes to dominate professional ones. And as a result, as members of the profession, we have an ethical responsibility to never, never take our professional identity for granted. We must constantly and deliberately assess that identity and then nurture and sustain those attributes that best serve the client and in our case, best prepare us to fight and win. I took away a cautionary tale for the US Navy specifically with parallels between what Gordon called that long calm lee of Trafalgar and the US Navy's history since World War II as pointed out by the very good question earlier. So when I was reading and reflecting the rules of the game, it made me realize that as stewards of our profession, we have an ethical responsibility to ensure that our Navy does not fall prey to complacency and professional erosion in what could be described as our own long calmly a lady gulf. And finally, I took away what I saw as a clear linkage between the lessons from this book and our own current design for maintaining maritime superiority. As you all know, or should know, the design highlights the critical importance of decentralized operations to achieve success in a complex environment. And it calls for our Navy to focus on being prepared for decentralized operations. As we discussed at the Ethics Symposium last fall, for those that were here, trust and initiative are the key enablers of decentralized operations. And bureaucratic organizations are characteristically low trust, low initiative organizations. Only an organization with a strong professional identity and the accompanying focus on, on competence and character, on the discretionary employment of specialized knowledge, and on the consistent employment of that knowledge in accordance with the shared action. Only a professional identity will engender the trust and the initiative that is necessary for our Navy to fight and win in a complex environment. 
So reading the rules of the game, it reinforced in me this idea that there is a war-fighting imperative that we view ourselves, that we view our Navy as a profession. And that such a view, this isn't just an academic exercise or a purely theoretical construct. This has practical and operational implications for our Navy. As stewards of the profession, I see that we have that ethical responsibility to ensure our professional identity and the attributes of the identity that are most required for success in warfighting, trust and initiative, that they are never taken for granted, but rather constantly and deliberately developed, nurtured, and sustained. So as you all prepare for returning to the fleet or other positions of responsibility in the joint force or the interagency, I challenge you to very deliberately, very mindfully, strengthen your own identity as a member of the profession and to develop and nurture the traits of trust and initiative in all of those with whom you have contact. One final story about the rules of the game. And I think that this helps explain its linkages between the lessons that come out in it and our own design. So when the CNO came to visit the War College last fall, uh, we had an opportunity to chat with him. We were speaking about leader development, some of the other uh, professional identity issues that we were addressing here at the college. And I talked to him a little bit about the, the book that General Mattis had directed me to. And I had asked him if he was aware of it. And the answer was, yes, Gardner, I'm aware of that book. And he stated that it was, in fact, one of his favorites. So when I got into the book, I missed this page. This is like page three of the book. So it took me a little while to recognize it. So when he was sub for several years ago, and this is pretty amazing, you know, on his own initiative, he recognized that this book had gone out of print. And he thought that this book was so important to the United States Navy that he, along with Pete Daly, currently the CEO, I think, of USNI, or director of the Naval Institute, um, they put together their own capital to have a, a second printing and reissue the book. So if, if you've got any desire for a, a more in-depth understanding of the intellectual underpinnings of how the CNO thinks about our profession, about how he thinks about leadership, and how he thinks about leader development, find time for these 700 pages. All right, thanks everybody. Um, I appreciate your attention. Uh, we've still got, we've got a little bit of time before we pop in and totally bust um, Dr. Cook's schedule here today, but happy to entertain some questions or comments or deflect them to the subject matter experts that are here with me today. Over to you.